Okay, let's go to Hebrews chapter 11. Continue on through the by faith uh, chapter here. We started last week, uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, learning that faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the convictions of not, things not seen, for by it men of old gained approval. And then I told you we're going to walk through all of these examples of people who are uh, living by faith. So that's what we're going to start now in uh, verse number four. By faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous. God testifying about his gifts, and through faith, though he is dead, he still speaks. I thought it was interesting that Abel is the first person spoken of in the by faith chapter. Adam, the first man, is not mentioned. Apparently, he did not have any notable big moments of faith to showcase. He makes the list of the biggest act of disobedience for sure. The original sin of mankind comes from Adam. But uh, Abel gets the distinction of being the first mentioned on the by faith list. I, I guess I find it interesting because I don't typically think of Abel as being on the Mount Rushmore of biblical heroes. In the Old Testament, you maybe jump to Abraham, Moses, David, or Daniel. Those would be some of my favorites. Abel only has a moment to live. His name actually in Hebrew means breath. And that's about as long as he lasted. Brevity is how we would describe Abel. His life was so short. But that, what, that fact does not disqualify him from the by faith list. Quality of life versus quantity is something we can consider in our observations of Abel. I think we all would say quantity of life is a priority. I would like as much life as possible, a good long life so that I can do all the things I want to do and enjoy the people that I love for as long as possible. But there is no guarantees of that. So it's wise to make the most of the life that you do have. The uh, Latin carpe diem, seize the day. Don't waste your time. You may not have as much of it as you think. It's sad to see some people wasting the amount of time that they do have. What good is quantity of life if you're spending it laying on the couch wallowing in self-pity? People procrastinate tackling important issues or initiating their big ideas. The problem with that is most of those visions require growth and development and investment of time and energy. And the longer you drag your feet to get started, the longer it takes to accomplish them. In the younger years, Ileana from time to time would bring up the idea of me, hey, Rob, you should go back to seminary and work on a master's. And I would shoot that idea down for like 10 years. Uh, I did a little bit of distance learning in that time. But finally, I got with the program. And when I was 33, I went back to school and got that master's thing done by age 36. But even if you feel, oh, I've waited too long, you know, you were still young in your 30s, don't talk yourself out of your dreams. Uh, Eliana learned her master's when she was 50. So she had that goal and she got at it and got it done. This is the time to get at it, to start working on a goal. Maybe start that exercise routine or start that job search or register for those classes, sign up for those lessons. This is the week to break a bad habit, maybe join a support group. This is the week to declutter your life or take a moral inventory, reorient your life. And above all else, I know for a fact, this is the time to trust in the Lord. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians, for he, has, he says, at a favorable time, I listened to you, and on a day of salvation, I helped you. Paul says, behold, now is a favorable time. Now is the day of salvation. Now, I'll be honest with you. I have wasted a lot of time in my life not being very productive. I, I really like music. I could have learned a musical instrument in the last 52 years. I didn't bother with that. I could have picked up some practical skills, maybe got some mechanical skills. That, that would save me a little bit of time and frustration and money. If I learned how to work on my own car, clearly it would have been more useful than a fantasy football championship. Got a couple of those. Those aren't paying me a dime. You know, maybe some investment or financial skills would have been helpful or some tech skills would have been good. But the one thing I did get straightened out on early in life, I 
learn to trust in Jesus. I didn't procrastinate on that one. And you don't need to either. Now is the day of salvation. It's such a short trip back to God. You know, part of the reason why it took me so long to get at the Masters is, oh, it's going to take so long. It's going to take three years. But you know what? Getting back with God is this quick. That's how quick it is. It doesn't have to be three years of study. It can just be a simple act that you do even today. That's how long it takes. You don't know how much time you have in this life. Just like Abel, our lives are a breath of vapor, just a moment. So get right with Jesus now. This is a day to take a step of faith. So let's take a moment and look at Abel's short life and turn to Genesis chapter 4, as this is where we find his whole life in eight verses. Genesis chapter 4, verse 1. Speaking of the first man, Adam, Adam had relations with his wife, Eve. They conceived and gave birth to Cain. And she said, I have gotten a man child with the help of the Lord. Chapter four, verse two. Again, she gave birth to his brother, Abel. And Abel was a keeper of flocks, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. So it came about in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the fruits of the ground. Abel, on his part, also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and for his offering, but for Cain and for his offering, the Lord had no regard. So Cain became very angry and his countenance fell. And the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door and its desire is for you, but you must master it. Cain told Abel his brother and he came about when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and killed him. And that's the story of Abel right there. Very short. So, See why I think it's interesting that he's like the first big person of faith? Uh, It says here that the Lord had regard for Abel's offering. And that Hebrew word regard is sha'al. It means to look, to gaze at. In contrast, God had no regard for Cain's offering. God disregarded Cain's offering. So the author of Hebrews tells us Abel's sacrifice affirmed attested, bore witness to the fact that he was righteous and God saw Abel as righteous. God saw his sacrifice and God saw Abel as righteous, his sacrifice being an act of faith. Meanwhile, Cain's was not. So it says here in chapter 11, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4, uh, one more time, by faith Abel offered to God a Better sacrifice than Cain. There's one of our key words in the book of Hebrews. What is it? Better. Abel sacrifice is better. So, what was his sacrifice? And why was it better? When Adam and Eve sinned, they uh, eyes were opened up to the fact that they were naked. Ah! And uh, they quickly grabbed some fig leaves and sewed them together. Right? And that really didn't work too good. So after the Lord had handed out the curses for sin, it says in chapter 3, verse 21, that the Lord made garments from the skin of an animal uh, and used that for Adam and Eve for clothing. God killed some animals and then made Adam and Eve clothing with the skins. So this is the first death as a result of the curse. Some animals had to die so their skins could be a covering. But also, most people would conclude that this is the beginning of the animal sacrificial system. As a way of staving off death for sin, the animal is substituted in the place of the individual. Not that that is explained in Genesis chapter 3, but it is the theme of animal sacrifices is all throughout Genesis. And then when we get to the books of Moses, 
uh, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. It's spelled out specifically all the details of the law of those sacrifices. Anyways, in Genesis chapter 4, the story of Cain and Abel, we see that Cain is a, what's he do for a living? He's a gardener. And Abel is a shepherd, a keeper of flocks. Both come with a sacrifice to the Lord. Abel brings the best lamb of his flock, and Cain brings the fruit of the ground. Now, with regards to Cain's offering, there is a time and a place in the law of Moses for grain offerings and first fruit offerings. First fruits in the Jewish feast is held in early spring. It's this particular feast at the beginning of the grain harvest. First fruits is the time to give thanks to God for his provisions. Our uh, Thanksgiving horn of plenty, as I have one up here, is, uh, is imagery that reflects that ancient custom. Look at all this abundance. We praise the God of creation for blessing the land with this bounty of food that we are enjoying here at the harvest time. Likewise, we often see in scripture that famine is a punishment from God as a way of showing people he is displeased with them. So that would be something I would recommend you pay attention to in 2023. Watch out for food shortages and reports of famine. And I recommend you make friends with some person with chickens because eggs are priceless right now. So don't miss the significance of that. Okay, but in Leviticus chapter 23, uh, the law of Moses instituted the first fruits offerings. The people were to bring a sheath of grain to the priest and he would wave it before the Lord and a burnt offering and a meal offering and then a drink offering were also required at that time. No grain was to be harvested until the first fruit offering was brought to the Lord. So you made the first harvest, first fruits, and you made that offering. And then once you did that, you could go harvest the rest of your field. The offering was made to, in remembrance of Israel's time of slavery in Egypt, how the Lord delivered them out of that, and then how he led them into the promised land and they could possess this land flowing of milk and honey and all this bounty. So it's an act of illustrating thankfulness and gratitude. And even today, we practice a form of this in our giving of tithes and offerings during our service. This is an act of faith. And we kind of say, you know, I give this portion of my paycheck back to you, God, to communicate that I'm trusting in you and not myself, not my money to meet my needs. I give this portion back to God to be used to the building of his kingdom. This gift is used for the furtherance of the gospel. Where? Here in. All right. You've learned my little saying, haven't you? You've heard that enough times. So giving a first fruits offering is not a bad thing. So then why did God disregard Cain's sacrifice? Why did God accept Abel's? Well, it's because Abel's wasn't a thanksgiving or a gratitude offering. Abel's offering was a sin offering, and there's a difference. So if you come to church and you're here this morning and you write a check and you put it as a gift to God in the offering plate, uh, it will take that back and it'll be cashed and the finance team will put that to good work for you and for us. Um, but you can't say, here, now God should be pleased with me. God ought to bless me because look at this, I gave this nice big gift to God. I regret to inform you, God is not pleased with you. God does not have to bless you. We will cash the check, but God does not have to bless you. Matter of fact, you are under a curse from God. He sees you as an enemy and you are doomed to suffer his wrath, regardless of how much that check was. What? I gave a gift. I was generous. How ungrateful of God. No, no, no. You don't understand. You owe a massive debt to God. You owe a sin debt. You owe God your life and you have to die. Your check, your gift, your vegetables do nothing to touch that debt. Everyone thinks, I'm a good person. I can do good things. God ought to be happy with my good things. He ought to accept me because of my goodness. 
Listen carefully. As soon as you started with, I'm a good person, you're lying. You are coming to a holy God who cannot tolerate sin, and you're coming in the door, and the first thing out of your mouth is a lie, is sin, is contradicting his word. And immediately he turns from you, he disregards you, and it does not matter what fruit basket you have in your hand, it does not matter what good deeds you think you can offer, they are all tainted and they are all rotten. What first you have to do is what Abel did. First, you have to come in and tell the truth. You have to come in with humility and confess, woe is me, I am unclean, I am a sinner, I am not worthy, my sin, my guilt, my debt requires death, and not just any death, it's got to be a sinless, spotless Lamb of God. It's going to require a righteous, innocent, just person to die for the unjust, and only that can pay the sin debts. Only that perfect, sinless offering can atone for my sin. Well, how on earth would that be possible? And where on earth could we find such a life? And the answer is nowheres. There is none righteous. No, not one. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It's physically impossible for any one of us to pay that debt. And since there is no earthly solution, then the answer must be a heavenly one. We need divine intervention, and this is what God has promised, that he would provide the sacrifice for us. God would make the way. He had the plan. We wouldn't be able to earn it. It's a gift, and it's an act of love. God commended his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, the Messiah, our Lord. The prophet foretold of this 730 years ago before the Messiah's death. Look at Isaiah 53, very familiar passage. We won't read all of it. Isaiah 53, I think uh, verse 7 is an interesting one to focus on. Talking about the Messiah. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a what? Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, like a sheep that is silent before his shears, he didn't open his mouth, but oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due, his grave was assigned with the wicked men, yet he was with a rich man in his death because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. But the Lord was pleased to crush him, to put him in grief. If the Messiah would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring, he will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. As a result of the anguish of his soul, God will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many as he will bear their iniquities. So did you catch that? Verse 10, the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief, rendering him a guilt offering so that his offspring could prolong it his day. As a result of the anguish of his soul, God will see it and be satisfied in his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, will justify the many as he will bear their iniquities, is the prophecy. That's the plan. And this is the way, the only way that the sins are atoned for. You are not good. Sorry. But you're not. All your righteousness is as filthy rags. You don't have anything. You can't pay anything for these sins. But God provides the sinless sacrifice. John the Baptist declared when he saw Jesus, Behold the what? Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That's the gift, the perfect sacrifice for our sins. So Abel, in bringing the lamb, is foreshadowing. It's Abel affirming, identifying with the promise. He's believing the limited revelation that he had received. God's lamb will be the sacrifice for my sin. So I'm coming into God, believing in what God has said. I'm guilty of sin, and this lamb is going to represent that 
guilt offering. Cain does not come with the guilt offering. Cain does not come acknowledging his sin. He comes with a good offering, expecting God to acknowledge Cain's good deeds. His good works ought to please God, but it's not pleasing to God. It is a lie, and this is why Abel's sacrifice is what? Is better, is better than Cain's. It's an act of faith, an act providing, an act proving that he was trusting in and believing what God had said. And this is why he is the first person in the by faith chapter, because he is the first one to have the conviction in things hoped for. He is convinced to trust in something he does not see, which is our definition of faith. Now, Adam, he saw God. He walked and talked with God. So he didn't have faith. He just, he knew God directly. Adam tells his boys about God, tells his boys about what God had said, tells them about the garden, tells them about sin, tells them about the death that is owed, tells them what they need to do with the sacrifices. And Abel believes and obeys, and Cain does not. But you know, then this weird thing happened there in Genesis. God speaks to Cain directly. And, and he says to Cain, 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 why are you angry? Why are you gloomy? Why, why you, if, you, if, you, if you do good, don't you know you'll be, your, your countenance will be lifted? If you do evil, sin's at the door. And to all the people who say, if God wants me to trust in him, why does he need to just show up and reveal himself? Why doesn't he just tell me what he wants? There's a famous atheist philosopher, Bertrand Russell. Must be from Southern Maryland, right? Russell, what's the last? Never mind. Anyways, he was once asked what he would say to God if he found himself standing before God after his death. And God said, Mr. Russell, why didn't you believe in me? Russell replied, I would probably say, sir, why didn't you give me better evidence? And Richard Dawkins and all the atheists, they think, oh, that's such a good quote. <laughs> you know, just put it back on God. But here's Cain who is, God is talking to him. God is telling him exactly what he wants, and Cain still doesn't believe. Because that's what it boils down to. It's not that people don't have enough evidence. It's that they reject the revelation that they've been given because they don't want to believe it. Cain was mad at the fact that his goodness wasn't enough and it wasn't acknowledged by God. But Abel, he comes with honesty, humility, and repentance. And this is what obtains him the testimony of righteous. Okay, okay. So, Pastor Rob, Abel offers the guilt offering, the lamb, thus illustrating his faith. So, why can't the Jews continue to offer the lambs? Right? That's what we've been studying in Hebrews. That's what they wanted to do. Stay with the temple sacrifices. And here's the author telling them not to do that. Well, good question. I knew you were thinking that. Because the animal sacrifices were foreshadowing, acting out, illustrating what Jesus the Messiah was coming to do. Now that Jesus has come and died, wanting to do the lamb sacrifices instead of accepting Jesus as the Messiah, is rejecting what God has done. Now, if you do the lamb sacrifices, you're not coming in faith with a sincere sin offering. No, you're coming with your good works like Cain, thinking God ought to accept you because of how awesomely religious you are. Look at me and all of my ab expertise of abiding by the law. Look at how good I am. And God says, no, I sent you the Messiah. Believe in him. Let's think about this for a moment, our communion, okay? Okay. This bread is my body broken for you. This do as often as you eat it in remembrance of me. This cup is the New Testament of my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. We don't just eat and drink that and believe in the ritual. We do it in remembrance, believing in Jesus. If you were sitting here today and you've never been to church, you didn't know any of this, and we passed you the bread in the cup, and you ate it and drank it, would you be a Christian? Would you be like, oh, whoa, I just, the Holy Spirit just jumped right in me. No, right? 
When I was, I remember this, I was, I was four or five years old, and I was sitting in church, because we didn't have kids' church and puppets and things like that. We still don't have puppets, you know, you guys could help with that. It's a little shout out for Hannah. So I'm sitting there, four and five, you know, bored, doing the, the wiggly thing. And uh, then the, the bread and the, and, the, and the juice passed by like it will be in a minute. And I wanted some. And my mom's like, no. So then afterwards, I'm like, well, I want to take communion. And my mother's like, okay, well, why do you want to take communion? I was like, well, I really like grape juice. <laughs> and I'm always hungry at church. <laughs> be a nice snack. And my mom said, that's not what it's for. It's not a snack. Sure, they could have let me eat it, but that wouldn't have been an act of faith because I'd eaten candy or anything anybody would have passed me at that moment. If somebody would have turned around and hand me a lifesaver, I'd have eaten that or a peppermint. The point is to know and to believe. Understand what you're doing and believe it. And then because you understand what it means, you then do it. So since the Messiah had come and died and rose again, sticking with sacrificing lamb was a sure way of communicating to God, I don't believe in Jesus. That sacrifice isn't good enough for me, and I need this animal to die in my place. So think about this. We're going to kind of take this to the future now. In the millennial kingdom, when Jesus returns and rules the earth, that's going to be a great time, right? Let me read you a, a prophecy about that. This is coming from Micah chapter 4. This is what it's going to be like. Micah chapter 4, verse 2. Many nations will come and say, Come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, so that he may teach us about his ways, that we may walk in his paths. For from Zion will come forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he will judge his between many people and render decisions for mighty distant nations and they will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations will not lift up sword against nation and never again will they train for war. And all of us in military industrial complex, people will be out of, jail, out, of, out of work. That'll be a great day, right? Nobody will have to work for the military anymore. Instead, we will all sit under our vine or our fig tree. No one will be afraid because the mouth of the Lord of armies has spoken. Okay, that's going to be a great day. Amen? Millennial kingdom. So let's pretend for a moment that Jesus has returned and he has set up that millennial kingdom. Doesn't that sound cool? But instead of saying to you, hey, let's go to Jerusalem so we can worship the Messiah, so we can hear directly from Jesus, what if I said, look, I'm not so sure about that new Jerusalem place. We all just need to stay here, Faith Bible Church, and I will keep telling you about God from the Bible. Our style of worship here is perfectly fine. I'll tell you about the millennial kingdom. You just stay here and don't listen to that Jesus guy in Jerusalem. What am I basically saying? I don't believe in Jesus in the new millennial kingdom. I don't believe he's the guy. I know better than God himself what God wants. And if that had happened, I sure hope that none of you would show up to church and I would just be standing here completely by myself. Right now, what we're doing is perfectly fine in this dispensation of time. But when the kingdom of God comes to earth, this will not be the way to worship. That's exactly what the author is trying to impress upon the people. Abel has the better sacrifice than Cain. And then Jesus has the better way over Moses. He's inaugurated this new covenant. And then when he returns to set up his kingdom, it will once again be time for a change. It'll be time to grow in our faith with new revelation. So this is what we learn from the short life of Abel. Even though he's dead, he speaks to us. And Abel died because he lived by faith. And his brother Cain, who did not live by faith, hated him for it. Actually, I think Cain was not so much angry with Abel. He was angry at who? He was angry at God. Cain couldn't do anything to make God change his mind or control God or even hurt God. So he took out all of his frustrations on God out on his brother. So Abel becomes the first martyr of the faith. And we see that is a reoccurring theme time and time again in Scripture. The people of faith are hated and even killed for speaking the truth. Nevertheless, Abel's testimony lives on 
The Lord regarded his sacrifice. That's what it said in Genesis. And just like back then, the Lord is still looking, always looking for that person who comes to him in faith. We see here from Proverbs, the eyes of the Lord are in every place, watching the evil and the good. And even now the Lord sees us. He sees you today. He sees into our very heart and our soul. What is he looking for? We know what he's looking for. The eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to what? Strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. He sees your heart today. So let's be honest with ourselves. He's looking. What is he seeing? Someone like Cain who thinks that they are oh so good and God ought to be happy with them. Look at me, God, I'm in church today. I deserve a blessing. Or does he see someone who's thinking, look, man, I'm just here because mom and dad made me. I'm kind of obligated to be here. It's past noon. Would you, you know, kind of pick up the pace here? We can get out of this. I don't need God. Some people think that way. Or does he see someone who's willing to tell the truth? Lord, I'm here because I need help. I've crapped up my life. I need to be forgiven. I'm here because I need Jesus to be my Savior. What's he see? He regarded Cain. I mean, he regarded Abel. He disregarded Cain. What will he do when it comes to you? Psalmist says the eyes of the Lord are towards the righteous. His ears are open to those cries. The eyes of the Lord are for him who fear him, for those who hope for his loving kindness. We fear the Lord, we hope for his kindness. And even today, say to the Lord, maybe every head bow at this time, every eye close. Say to the Lord, Lord, I need, I need your help. I, 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 I mess up so much. I have so much sin here. Lord, may you see humble hearts in this place. Jesus, may you hear the confessions of sin that are prayed even now in the hearts and the minds of these people. Someone here today, just bring that sacrifice of humility. Someone here today, just say, Dear Lord Jesus, please forgive me of my sins. I believe that you are, Je you are God. You died for my sins. You paid the price. Please forgive me. If we would say that and confess our sins, he gives us a promise that he will forgive us and cleanse us. Lord, I pray that each and every soul here today would be humble enough and honest enough to admit that and trust in you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.